Welcome to BJ Investigates, a show I just created. It might never do again. So in today's episode, we're gonna take a little twist, a little turn. We're gonna talk about something that you might be surprised that I'm talking about. Tana Mojo. Roll the fan cam. Creator of the year. Tana. What if I just cover your face while I say that Manny MUA could have dressed so much better? Dude, every other YouTuber sucks. He f***ed me with a toothbrush. Back to the money. All you bitches owe me for paying your rent. And no, you can't come back stage at my event. Cause maybe I'm a VIP. Nobody puts you on the list. Sorry, sis. I wouldn't have it this way. Sorry, I'm pretty and easy to hate. Sorry, the gays let you think that you ate. But it's over, bitch. Now give me that pay. You bitches ain't like me. You bitches ain't like me. Girl, stop it. You bitches ain't like me. You bitches ain't like me. Stop it. So you might be surprised to know that I even know Tana Mojo exists, but honestly, I would be surprised if you didn't because she is super famous. She's one of the most famous YouTubers like possibly ever. And I definitely remember several years ago, she became famous by doing these sort of like story times. I had a very weird experience with Dr. Phil and I had a really frustrating, angry, bad experience with the Teen Choice Awards and why not make up and talk about them. She would talk about all these crazy wild twists and turns that her life was taking. I was like, dude, Tana, you have so many more drunken alcohol, you're a dumb bitch style stories, so why don't we just keep up with that theme? Now, since those story times, she became a bona fide celebrity. I think her manager is like Larry Rudolph or Scooter Braun or one of those weirdos. And she's like a bona fide celebrity at this point. And you're inspired by Brit Brett. Um, yes, definitely inspired by her, but I would not even try to say I'm paying tribute or anything like that because she's way too iconic. I'm way too bootlegged. She's an icon. Britney, sweetie, I'm so sorry. She's in the who's who of Hollywood and all of that. Well, recently she went on the H3H3 podcast or one of those spinoffs, basically an interview with Ethan Klein. And she talked about the fact that her parents had sued her for slander or defamation. And y'all already know, if one of the YouTube girlies is getting sued for defamation, I am all over it at this point because I know exactly how it feels to be able to try to tell everybody in the world who will listen to you the damn truth. And then somebody comes along and threatens you with a frivolous lawsuit. Now we are gonna get into what the allegations were that Tana made in that interview and maybe why she hasn't talked about it before, et cetera, et cetera. Also, I did take a deep dive into the internet to look up the lawsuit and spoiler alert, I didn't find it. But I have some theories on why that is and I will get into that as well. Tana Mojo is an only child. She was born to parents named Rick or AKA Richard and Rebecca Mojo in 1998. Um, Tana historically has claimed that her parents did not really carry the weight of the parenting responsibility. To be real, my family is like definitely very dead to me. Like, so like I'll never, I'll probably never talk to them again. Like it's just more not cool. That's how it is. So Amari, my best friend, his family kind of took me in and they're kind of like my mom and dad. And like I go to their house for the holidays and stuff. But even that like shows me the importance of like what it takes for them as a family of three kids to bring in like a fourth kid. Everyone else in my house 24 seven in the summertime would have to like suffer and be like, hot in the house 24 7 because my dad would not let the air conditioning go under like 75 75 air conditioning in Vegas in like the dead heat you might as well have the heat on I started complaining about this 24 7 and so my dad every day when I would get home from school <laughs> he would like shut all of the blinds and like put blankets over the windows and, like in this whole two story house, it would make the whole house like like pitch black. And so I would get home from school and it'd be like 2 p.m. and like I would want to bring my friends over. And, like, the entire house would just be pitch black. I remember one day I had a friend over and we come downstairs for breakfast. Like my friend spent the night, which first of all, just spending the night in my house, like I'm sorry. <laughs> we come downstairs and my dad is cooking breakfast and I'm like, God, I need a mom. Like you don't have a job. Like you couldn't have just gotten up and like made the one friend I brought over for the one time like some you know, pancakes. We walk down into the kitchen. And my dad has like a skillet with like a dirty ass fork that like has not been washed and he's like licking like <laughs> So in the skillet he takes out like last night's spaghetti that my mom made Just letting you know that would happen every day for my entire life Like my dad would be cooking something that just would be like the most unappetizing, incompetent, inhumane like meal that like dogs shouldn't eat And then like scream at me for like 
not eating like everything the way it was prepared and every time I would lift up my phone to vlog like that he would scream at me. I had like hundreds of clips of him being like stop me vlogging like wouldn't even let me talk in my vlog every time I had to vlog he would like bat my phone out of my hand like make me stop and would tell me every day like YouTube's going nowhere you're never gonna make any money like go work two jobs he would like walk to my old jobs and like beg my old managers take me back and ish. would like walk into my new work and be like give her more hours like <laughs> and then the second I started making YouTube money he's like give your dad some like come on Tana like I took care of you I raised you and I'm like she's also gone on record many times to say that her best friend's parents they're more like Tana's parents she would say when I needed adult advice in my life I would go to my friend's parents I would not go to my parents because basically according to her they didn't really know how to act words can't express how grateful I am for my best friend's family like they they are literally my mother and my father and she also says that that friend's parents basically adopted her basically took her in off the mean streets of las vegas whenever she was like 13 years old and she still has a very close relationship with them she seems to really appreciate their influence on her life so in this h3h3 podcast interview tana was asked by ethan klein about her parents about her childhood about things that she had said even in the past and she was very reluctant to talk about it my best friend's family like basically adopted me when i was like 13 like and took me and like now every holiday I go see them they're my family 100% but like my family I was born into they were they were just very crazy they I mean all their money was very elite it's not I it's so hard I, I can't say a lot of things for legal reasons there's like a whole with your parents uh-huh I was very independent. Like I did everything on my own for as long as I can remember. It, like it, just even my meals and my money and getting to school and doing anything. That's one of the main reasons I dropped out of school. Like it was just like nothing was a functioning routine and I never learned that. I was very much so independent. And anytime I really needed to fall on a parental figure for anything, it was always my best friend's family. That's gotta be painful skillet. though that like your relationship with your parents is so fraught. 100%. That, that's hard. That's really... And obviously being an only child through that as well and not really having someone yeah. to like, and that's why I credit my best friend to like saving my life or like mm. being my brother. He still lives with me to this day. Like he's literally my mm. brother and it's amazing. I credit him to really helping me with that. She said she was afraid of further legal repercussions and she didn't want to end up back in court with her parents or anybody. She revealed that back during like the time that you had to go to court on Zoom, she said it had been three years. So I'm assuming it happened in 2020. She said in 2020, she was sued by her parents for slander or defamation. And she ultimately ended up settling that lawsuit with them and had to pay them, she said, a couple or a few hundred thousand dollars. So are you going through litigation right now with no. your parents? This was, it's over. Um, this was like two or three years ago, probably. And did you guys settle? Yeah, out, because out it's basically, I guess I can talk about that. I signed a non-disparagement. I received a letter, you know, that basically said, you said these things on this reality show. You know, when I was on MTV and I had a show, we went and kind of toured my childhood home I said a lot of things that someone in court could say you know create a loss of income or which is so untrue it was definitely just a money a cash grab everyone was very in my opinion um but everyone was very aware of it being like that yeah we settled and I had to pay them like a couple hundred thousand dollars wow it that must that felt like Oh my God, that was like the day in my head where they really like, they were dead to me, you know what I mean? The majority of the lawsuit from what she disclosed on the podcast, again, I wasn't able to find the lawsuit. I did find some court paperwork, we'll get into that. But from what she disclosed in the lawsuit, she said the allegations had arisen from things that she said in her 2019 reality show, Tana Turns 21. This is like so cute, like my family would never have made me take a photo like this. That's what's like crazy, it's yeah. like tradition. That's so crazy to me that your mom like prepared that whole ass dinner with like, like my mom would like, I would have to prepare the dinner. Last year was the first year I like did Christmas, like not at my house and I did it at Amari's house. Cause it was like, at least his family's like, having like a structured dinner and like there's kids opening presents. It's the holidays. Yeah. I don't know. I, and I went to my house and dropped <laughs> off gifts and it was like so sad to me. Cause I was like, this just doesn't even like feel like Christmas. You can pretend to love your family as much as you want, but it's not like I like them. Like I don't, you know, connect with them. 
It's like if my parents die, am I gonna spend the rest of my life regretting the fact that I like didn't go this Christmas? But also, if I go this Christmas, I'm going to be sad the entire time because it's going to be me doing everything, holding everything together, you know, being the parent. It's like I'm the parent of my parents, you know, it sucks. I don't wanna be that, I just wanna be the kid. You're angry at them. You're yeah. Trying, like about your childhood. Yeah, <laughs> about I how think- how you were raised. Yeah, I think it lies more like forgiveness. I think I can like say I forgive them as much as I want, but it's like, you sucked. You were terrible parents. Like it's never gonna be undone. Like I never had what like everyone else had, you know? That's just like, that's just life. To me, the only person who really feels like family is Amari. He literally in one person is like the whole family I never had. Now that was put out exclusively on YouTube, but it was done in conjunction and coordination with MTV. I do think I watched an episode or two of that, but at the time, 2019, like I was like 28 or 29 years old. She was like a young girl, not even 21 years old, doing some things. Look, listen, I fully support her being able to do those things. Maybe I wasn't the target audience for that particular reality show. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like, I get similar feelings watching the show Euphoria. It's like, it's a show about, Kit. Anyway, in that series, Tana made a series of statements and allegations pertaining to her parents, pertaining to her childhood, and pertaining to how she was brought up. She insinuated that there may have been some medical neglect. She said that when she turned 18, she immediately got a bunch of dental work done. She also has made allegations since then, so it's hard for me to remember exactly what allegations she made during the show versus after. My parents never like instilled anything that parents instill in you, like structure, responsibility, or schedule. I dropped out of high school at 15 because I couldn't even like go to school on time. Like so many of the mistakes I feel like I made in the beginning of my career were from lack of so many things like I needed, you know? Yeah. Just like very chaotic, very rebellious, very like butting of heads. Is, I moved is that out because they're very rebellious in the same way you are or? Um, I don't know how to put it. I, well, I do. It's just, it, it's just dark and I, I get in trouble talking about it. It's very weird. My, my family was just very like abusive and just not dope. <laughs> but like, you know, they just, the way they raised me wasn't it. They just neglected mm -hmm. me in like a lot of ways. I definitely didn't get like proper healthcare, proper food, proper schooling, proper love, proper nurturing. The crux of the lawsuit seems to have been arising from the allegations and statements she made in that show, the MTV Tana Turns 21 show. So there's one particular scene where Tana describes herself going through her house, her old childhood home. I want to see how ghetto one of my old houses was. Go left here. It's like the first left. Oh, really? Do you remember the exact house? Yeah, for sure. This one? Yeah. So ghetto, huh? Oh. Isn't that so insane that I lived there for like five years? Oh my God. And she was talking about different aspects of her childhood. Imagine that house like filled with bugs. Really? She would make one-off comments, like I said, that there were roaches in her house. Cockroaches like crawling up the walls like every day. And my dad would just be like, the house isn't infested. Oh, it has bugs. <laughs> It was so ghetto. Okay, can we leave? I'm so happy that I never have to live like this again. <laughs> yeah. That she would not eat for like a week at a time. <laughs> what was it that you said that, that they took issue with? A thousand anecdotal sentences. Like, oh, there were roaches in my Just house Just a bunch up. of sh -ish. Or, oh, I remember, like, you know what I mean? Hypothetically, I could have said something like, oh, I didn't eat for a week growing up. Mm -hmm. Like, there were no, there was no food, or there was roaches in the house, or... So and like I said earlier, she did mention that dental work comment, which would insinuate that her parents were neglecting her medical needs. I was talking about how when I got to LA, one of the first things I spent money on was an immense amount of dental work. And then it wow. was because mm -hmm. I never really yeah had dental care <laughs> yeah. you can't say it you can't say it yeah. yeah yeah but you can say you got a bunch of dental work and we can infer what that means yeah um just but just uh, yeah everything it was crazy for sure not only neglecting her medical needs but neglecting her hygiene needs and the things that she would need to you know keep her dental hygiene in check and to keep her from needing to go get a bunch of dental work so basically one day tana wakes up and receives a cease and desist type letter from a lawyer who was representing her parents at the time. Basically, the letter said, you said these things in a reality show. And Tana was essentially given an itemized bullet point list of all the things that she said that her parents took issue with. They, they just itemized all this. I itemized every, and then I just had to sit in court and sit there and go through every single sentence. And her parents, through this lawyer, said that those statements could be considered defamation, and those statements had resulted in loss of income or could result in loss of income and loss of work and all kinds of stuff her parents were trying to act like was gonna happen based on those statements. So the lawsuit hit during the heat of the 
beep demic. It did seem as though in the interview, Tana didn't like that everything was going to be on Zoom. It got to a point where it would have been years in court and it would have been a public trial and it would have been like medical subpoenas, Seriously? medical subpoenas all the time and just like so much. We couldn't, you couldn't get rid of it on, on like before a trial? Uh-uh. I tried as hard as I possibly could. Oh, um, and and I just I don't want to see them. I don't ever again. I don't want to talk to them ever again. I don't want to feel that way ever again. I don't want to watch them defend that all the this shit they did to me was that they were good parents. Just watching, in my opinion, lie. Mm -hmm. She also said in the interview she was going to have to turn over her medical records her psychiatrist records. She was gonna have to basically prove that all the things that she was saying was true. And as we know on this channel and my other channels, facts ain't defamation, but some crazy weird freak can sue you for it. And now you're having to open up all your medical records. And let me tell y'all one thing right now, spoiler alert, I will not be handing over my medical records to any damn body. So if that's the point of this lawsuit, Lima, to Kali Mora Yavrimovich, you're not getting them. It ain't happening anyway. But I can obviously relate and understand why Tana wouldn't want to do that. So she took issue with having to do that and the prospect of perhaps having to do that in the future. This is where the hunt for the lawsuit comes into place. Now, I do want to mention just yesterday, so I haven't really given her a lot of time, but yesterday I did email the business inquiry Tana Mojo email address and I said, look, listen, I know you can't talk about this lawsuit. I know you can't talk about anything that happened, but it would be nice if you could at least like, I don't know, maybe point me in the direction of where I might find the legal paperwork so I can talk about it. But she did not respond. Again, I don't, I mean, I don't usually respond to emails within one day. So I'm not saying like, oh, she didn't respond. Ethan did ask her, did you sign a NDA, a non-disclosure agreement? Basically, I guess I can talk about this. I don't know. I mean, well, did you sign lawyer. an NDA? And she said she had signed a non-disparagement agreement. I signed a non- disparagement which very often ndas and non-disparagement agreements and confidentiality agreements and all that will be signed on one agreement and so it seemed like she did not sign a non-disclosure agreement but she did sign something that basically said i'm not going to disparage my parents and so for that i think she is justifiably afraid of going out and talking about this issue because anything can be construed as disparagement and now she lands right back in court so she did say on the h3 podcast that she luckily got to work with a mediator so she didn't have to directly communicate with the parents and she basically said that they're dead to her. It's largely known that Tana is from the Las Vegas, Nevada area. That's where she was born, that's where she was raised, and that's seemingly where her parents continue to live. Now, I did look up her parents in the Las Vegas property records, and it does not seem as though they own property in Las Vegas, so I can't confirm exactly where they live. And I started looking into two places for this lawsuit. One place I looked was Los Angeles, because that's where Tana now lives, and that's where she would have been living at the time of this lawsuit. I also looked in Las Vegas, I looked specifically specifically in Henderson Municipal Court, which I don't know why defamation would be in a municipal court, but I looked everywhere that I could and I could not find it. But it does seem as though Las Vegas, and I think it's like the eighth judicial district or something like that, does have this special family court mediation program. So there are some mojos, Gary and Elizabeth, who do own some property in Vegas. So I don't know if those are relatives or not, but that's the only thing I could really find. But I think once things go into mediation, mediation and because maybe it dealt with family members, there's extra levels of protection. Perhaps once something goes into mediation, it's hidden from public view. Maybe I'm just incompetent at looking up records. I could not find this lawsuit. I couldn't find anything having to do with this slander, libel, or defamation suit and the mojos, but I did find some interesting things. For example, one of the things that Tana said or alluded to in this H3 podcast interview was that her parents might have had a pretty toxic relationship from the beginning. Ethan kind of asked Tana, like, you know, are they still together? They love each other. They stay on the same team. And Tana, again, seeming very visibly afraid to mention anything, was like, it was toxic. It was bad. And so court records would support that. From 1994 to 2001, according to court records, and I will put these pictures up here, indicate that her parents filed for divorce four times. Once in 1994, once in 1996, 
and once in 1997. Now, Tana, like I mentioned earlier, was born in 1998. So before Tana ever even came into the damn picture, her parents were clearly not good at figuring out how to get along. And so that's the environment that Tana was born into. Maybe she's not allowed to talk about it anymore, but that's what the court records say. Then again, in 2001, when Tana would have been like three, four years old, something like that, they filed for divorce again. They're still married to this day, so they really couldn't figure out what they wanted to do. The most recent divorce filing from 2001, there was like obviously gonna be a battle over custody. There was things filed like motions for sole legal custody, sole physical custody, supervised visitation. And both of the parents are the plaintiffs in this. So I don't know which one was filing for those things. They wanted temporary spouse support, plaintiffs attorney's fees. So one of these people was really going for the throat. They were going all the way for it. Sole legal custody, sole physical custody, the only way the other parents Parent was going to be able to visit was supervised visitation, spousal support. They were going for the full and everything you could go for, they were going for it. I don't know. I mean, obviously they didn't end up getting divorced, I guess, like according to Tana. They're now finding something in common, which is wanting Tana Mojo's money and silent. But in the podcast, she did speak about how she feels silenced and that it's frustrating because she can't even reclaim that story now. She went through all of that as a child. She made a name for herself, whether you appreciate or like the way that she did it or not. Point remains, she built something out of herself. She built a brand out of herself and she built a following and a community of people who care about what she has to say and what she went through. She can't even talk about that now. And I truly cannot imagine being in a situation where you're trying to talk about something that happened to you and it's all true and your parents sue you for it. It's absolutely preposterous and they should be ashamed of themselves. And Tana talks about the way that it happened. Apparently this lawyer took the case on a contingency basis. Contingency basis is what ambulance chasers do. And listen, I think personal injury law is a very, very important area of the law. And I don't really agree that all these personal injury lawyers are necessarily bad for doing that. Vulnerable people who don't have money to pay lawyers do get harmed, they do get hurt, and they don't have a way to pay a lawyer. So I don't think a contingency basis lawyer is necessarily a bad thing, but it does give the lawyer a different incentive than charging by the hour. Tana knows this too, and she mentioned it on the H3 podcast. She said, any and everything that this judge or possibly jury would have found me liable for would have been more money in the lawyer's pocket because how contingency works is you're not paying the lawyer $100, $500, $1,200, whatever an hour. You're paying them a percentage of what award you get. So let's say the parents would have gone all the way through with this defamation case. It would have been a trial they would have been awarded a million dollars. That lawyer would have been awarded a percentage of that. So the lawyer had a personal vested financial interest in throwing the book at Tana. And Tana said that. She said, there was these itemized list of everything I've ever said, everything anywhere I've ever said. And it's like, I was gonna have to sit there and fight every single thing on Zoom. And she said, and that lawyer was being so mean to me. Tana said that lawyer was basically accusing Tana of being a wild bleep addict, bleep promiscuous, like bad person. And Tana said at the time, it, it honestly started affecting her, her self-confidence, and it started affecting how she saw herself. It started affecting her confidence in being able to defend these things, which were all true according to her. So for all of those reasons, plus her privacy, plus just her mental health, her mental state, she decided to settle this lawsuit through mediation. The lawyer would say things to Tana like, are you sure that you really wanna be in court with this? We're gonna drag this out. And essentially telling her that she was like a washed up Hollywood mess and the judge would take her sweet elderly parents. Oh, that's another thing she said. Her parents are old. They were in their 50s raising her as like a child. So they had her like late on in their lives as far as like having kids is concerned. And so now her being, you know, 21, she might've been 23 at that point. The parents were like in their 60s at least. And so it's like these old frail people against this like girl who was gonna be painted in a certain light in this court case and she knew it. she was using it against Tana. Tana also said that she could really relate to Jeanette McCurdy, another child star from, what was she in? iCarly. Another child star from iCarly who wrote a book called like, I'm glad my mom died or something like that. And Tana said, I can totally relate to that because a lot of times whenever it's your parents who are the ones who abuse you, people don't 
believe you or they blame you for it or they say you know that's your only mom that's your only dad you know they're not going to be here forever you should call your mom you should try to make amends and it's like that really gets inside people's head because i think there is a part of you that always deep down hopes and prays that your parents will just start acting right all of a sudden and that you can have a good relationship you see your friends parents you see your cousins parents you see them all like loving their kids and acting normal and you're like maybe i could have that and then you have all these outside influences being like it is your mom well it is your dad and it's like but people are so so gaslighty it's like they don't actually realize that somebody could be a parent and also could not have that child's best interest at heart and it seems like that's something that tana at least in the past has struggled with and ethan even asked her to close out the interview he was like well what if you found out you know that one of your parents was really sick or like you could only have one more time to talk to them like wh what would you do and she was like i mean <laughs> Probably not answer the phone, because I don't answer numbers that I don't know. <laughs> what if they called you and they're like, hey, I'm dying, I just want to... I wouldn't uh, answer. Really? I mean, well, I don't answer unknown callers and I wouldn't answer if it was their number, I guess. But she was like, I guess, I don't know, like if I was in a situation where I was already talking to them, I definitely was on the phone with them or whatever, she was like, I would probably be like a decent person about it. I would probably say, you know, sorry, you're going through that or whatever. I mean, I guess if somehow an interaction happened where we were on the phone, they said that I would, I mean, I would probably just respond like a human being, like I'm really sorry that's happening and Damn. hope just you were in a better place in the last quarter. Uh, got any issue can sell to give me my money back <laughs> but it's it's not really the same anymore she said she's gone through a lot of therapy and it's just not something that she's affected by the same way anymore but i could definitely tell based on her behaviors and her actions in this interview her words her lack of words in some cases that it is something that hangs over her head that she can't just tell her own story. She can't just say what she wants to say about it. And I think it's preposterous. I think the time for these frivolous bullshit defamation cases needs to be over. I think you should face criminal charges for filing frivolous defamation cases because all it does is infringe on the freedom of speech. And yes, only the government technically can infringe on the constitutional right, like a private individual cannot do that. But look around YouTube right now. Everyone is looking over their shoulder like, oh, can I say this? Oh, I don't know if I can say that. I don't know if I can say this. And it's like, we are self-censoring to a degree that it's, it's out of control and it is frivolous defamation cases just like this one that's contributing to it. Also, the Orwellian censorship we're dealing with, but I can't talk about that too much on this platform either because you already know what will happen. That being said, make sure to like this video, make sure to subscribe to the channel, make sure to share it because who knows what's gonna happen next. That's all I really had for today. In the meantime, facts ain't defamation. Love you, mean it, okay, bye. I, I promise you, I'm, I'm fine. You don't have to 5150 me at Coachella.